um, this next um, uh, panel and discussion um, about this attempt to build an, an, an international freedom curriculum um, between uh, the schools uh, on our side of the border, schools in Windsor, um, a little bit of it's being piloted um, you know, here through some of uh, the connections between um, the University of Michigan and a program called Wolverine Pathways. Um, but I'm going to let our next presenters tell you all about their work because they can do it much better than I can. So let me introduce Darren Stockdale. Oh, we have Chantelle, hurry. And the, or she's probably this way uh, on the monitor. We're kind of hoping that this hybrid experience is going to work out well. But thank you so much for being here. And Darren, I'll just let you. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Good morning, Chantelle. I know you probably can't see me. Uh, I'll let Chantelle introduce herself uh, when it's her turn. Uh, and Clarissa Codrington is our third partner who is going to present today, who is actually working with the youth of Wolverine Pathways today and couldn't make it, but she prepared a video, so you will hear her voice. And I'm Darren Stockdale. I'm the design coordinator at a center called CEDAR in the School of Education here at the University of Michigan. CEDAR is the Center for Education, Design, Evaluation, and Research, and I do curriculum development and teacher professional learning. And we're going to talk today about this ongoing curricular project called Resistance Along the Fluid Frontier, the Detroit River Project International Freedom Curriculum. So a very quick note, this is a collaborative effort with multiple partners, as you can see. Um, so we have the Detroit River Story Lab, which kind of, uh, I'll say more a little bit about the history of their involvement in the project. That's uh, under the leadership of David Porter. Dr. Dillard's involved in that as well. Many faculty at U of M are involved in the Detroit River Story Lab. Wolverine Pathways is a career pathway program here at the University of Michigan where students in the communities of Ypsilanti, Detroit, and Southfield have the opportunity to join in summer learning opportunities and after school and weekend learning opportunities. And if they complete the program and they get accepted to U of M, they're guaranteed uh, tuition. So it's a really cool pipeline program to provide youth from those three communities a pathway to the University of Michigan. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about their involvement as we go on. The Detroit River Project, under the leadership of Kim Simmons, was a key impetus in this project. And researchers and scholars uh, from the Essex County Black Historical Research Society, including Chantel, were involved as well, and as I already mentioned, Cedar. Um, so this is our design team. I want to start off just kind of giving honor to the people involved in this pro project. So, of course, I'm involved. Samantha Adams is involved. She's a graduate student working with the Detroit River Story Lab and also working with Kim Simmons uh, from the Detroit River Project. Clarissa Codrington was our pilot teacher. I'll say, and you'll hear from Clarissa via video later on with Wolverine Pathways. And Chantelle is my co-designer in terms of the curriculum. And Chantelle will tell you a little bit about herself when it's her turn to speak. Um, so what is our mission for this curricular project? We started off with, um, I'll say a little bit more about the story of the development of the project in a moment, but I want to highlight our mission because what we really want to do is celebrate, honor, and share the history of black resistance to enslavement in Michigan and Canada through development of a transnational curriculum for middle school students that focuses on cross-border resistance to slavery. In this process, our goal is to position young people, especially young people of color, as historians and empower them to tell important stories about the history of collective action for freedom in their communities. As you'll hear from Clarissa later on, when most young people in the state of Michigan learn about slavery and learn about enslavement, they learn about it as if it was something that happened somewhere else, as if it really just was a southern phenomena and the Northland was the, 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 the beacon of freedom. And there's, of course, some nuance and some truth to that, but it's a lot more complicated. So one of our goals is to complicate students' understanding of enslavement and resistance, particularly of resistance to enslavement, to let young people know that slavery was an institutionalized system that impacted the whole nation, and it wasn't just something that happened somewhere else, and that their community, in particular, played a very important and key role in resistance to enslavement. And so we want to position young people to begin forming their own narratives and to question the dominant narratives that they see in the textbooks that leave so many important stories out. And again, when Clarissa uh, presents in her video a little bit about her experience this summer, you'll hear a little bit about the raw emotion that that actually provokes in young people when they start learning about the history that took place in their own community. Um, 
So this work began through several, several through ways, and I want to emphasize this is definitely a project that is in development, ongoing, and in very much in process. So we are no, by no, we're really just getting started in some ways. Um, so Kim Simmons and the Detroit River Project had been, had done some work with teachers and had been uh, working around some curriculum. Uh, David Porter began the Detroit River Story Lab with many of his colleagues and faculty and really focusing on this idea of the Detroit River as a central location for storytelling and narratives. And at some point, David could say more about this, David and Kim bumped into each other and had a conversation that led to some, some ideas around developing a curriculum. The work that I do at U of M is precisely that. I, and I'm a former social studies teacher, I should say. I taught social studies for many years in Detroit. Um, thank you. Um, went back to school because I felt like I hadn't learned enough as a teacher, and I also felt like the resources weren't out there to do the kind of teaching that I wanted to do. So I went back to school here at U of M, became a curriculum developer and a teacher, teacher trainer. Um, and so now at CEDAR, what I do is I partner with faculty-led initiatives and also with K-12 initiatives and develop my own programming sometimes that are really focused around the intersections of place-based learning, social justice education, and literacy development, and also historical thinking are kind of the intersecting areas that I really care about. Um, so David uh, got connected to CEDAR, the center where I work, and we began talking about what would it mean to develop a curriculum that involves youth in both Canada and the United States to really learn about the movement back and forth across the border that was connected to anti-racism and uh, resistance to enslavement. So um, as we began talking, we began building this team, and I got connected with Chantel, who is an educator in Windsor, Canada, uh, Windsor, Ontario, and uh, we began developing this curriculum. And then David connected to Wolverine Pathways, and then I connected with Wolverine Pathways. Again, this youth development summer learning program, and we said, hey, we've got a curriculum. You want to pilot it? And they agreed to pilot it, and we'll say more about the pilot as it goes on. So then we've had an initial pilot of this curriculum really delving deep into these stories. So as I mentioned, this is an ongoing process. So um, our first phase, which really began um, almost more than a year ago, was really just the development of our overall vision and our plan, the building of our team, and the beginning of the curriculum development, which um, was primarily done by Chantel and I over Zoom. Chantel's in Canada, I'm in the US, she can't cross the border, I can't cross the border. Um, we're close, but we're separated by an international border, but we've been collaborating closely over uh, online with uh, regular meetings with Kim Simmons and Sam, Samantha Adams to provide input and feedback on our design. Then this summer, we piloted with a small group of youth um, what you have to understand about Wolverine Pathways is that this summer they had to do their programming obviously online. It was a virtual program. So these kids had just gone through a full year of virtual schooling and then they volunteered, they essentially, I don't want to say volunteered because they have a commitment to the program, but on their own time during the summer they're also doing summer learning, virtual. So we had to think very carefully about how to turn a curriculum that's ultimate vision is for face-to-face -face interaction in a classroom to an online summer learning program. So there's a lot of adaptation that's currently gonna have to be going on because of the, the changing formats. But we prepared a four-week learning experience for the, for the youth and then Clarissa uh, met with us and learned about the curriculum and embedded herself in the team and began coming to meetings. And then she went through the curriculum as we had developed it with a small group of youth um, this summer. So Chantel and I right now are in this process of thinking about what does it mean to take this four-week online experience that was for rising 10th graders, so students who had just left 9th grade and gone into 10th grade, scale it back a little bit for 7th and 8th grade because curricular-wise, this maps onto learning in Ontario in 7th grade and in Michigan in 8th grade and a little bit in Ontario in 8th grade. So we're looking at 7th and 8th grade. So we've got to scale back the, the complexity of the work a little bit build in some more scaffolds, and then create sort of teacher face-to-face -face lesson plans that go along with it. So that's where we're at right now. And we're slowly reaching out to uh, schools and teachers on both sides of the border to begin, but very slowly because we don't want to promise something and, and start offering something until it's ready to be delivered. So it's um, kind of a slow rollout. But what we anticipate is that 
we'll have a, a, a pilot version ready, hopefully by the beginning of the next semester, and really be ready to do full pilots um, in the upcoming fall and getting it out to teachers and classrooms on both sides of the border. And then our ultimate vision is to have students connecting, probably virtually, but we're even envisioning cool things like imagine we have two, there's two monuments, right? There's a monument in Detroit and there's a monument in Windsor. And how cool would it be to have kids literally looking at each other from across the river and then meeting somewhere to talk about their, their, their learning or even meeting online. So we really want to foster interaction between youth on both sides of the border to talk about what this border has meant historically and how it is a fluid frontier and how the movement back and forth, uh, resistance against enslavement and racism has, has shaped this region. So it's kind of a cool idea. And it's never been done before, as far as we know. So we're excited about it. So I'm going to talk you through the broad scope of the curriculum. Uh, and then Chantel will talk you through sort of the meat and the heart of the curriculum, which is our, our resistance case studies, or our freedom seeker case studies. So you see, this is, this is taken literally from the instructional materials. It was all slide driven because again, it was virtual. And so Clarissa was leading you through activities. Um, she was, they would meet synchronously in the morning, then they would have asynchronous learning tasks to do, and then they would reconnect at the end of the day for synchronous check-ins. And it was kind of a back and forth of synchronous and asynchronous work over the summer. But this is what the students saw. This is their course overview, and I'll just highlight a few things. It's a lot of text for a slide, and I apologize for that, but this is part of online learning and virtual learning and trying to cram a lot in. We're still working on trying to get the right amount. Um, but again, for, for the youth, the idea is you're gonna be a community historian, and you're gonna explore the early history of abolition, the Underground Railroad, resistance to slavery, anti-racist organizing, border crossing, and freedom seeking along the Detroit River. They're gonna explore the stories of freedom seekers, work in teams to create historical narratives and exhibits that celebrate these heroes and educate others. And our ultimate goal is that through discussion, and this was hard to do online, but through discussion, get kids talking about today's struggles for racial justice and connecting these narratives from the past and drawing inspiration from this long legacy of resistance um, and pulling that forward to today. And even thinking about narratives of border crossing and what does it mean to be a refugee and taking advantage of this opportunity right now where there's really political discussions around people seeking refuge and helping students understand that that changes over time and through historical uh, uh, events and patterns and so really compl again complicating their textbook versions of history is what we wanted to do. So the driving question so this is an inquiry driven unit where students are presented with a question at the very beginning. And their goal is to constantly return to that question and add to their understanding and come up with their own evidence-based response to this question. And so we start with the preamble to the Constitution that says, we the people, in order to form a more perfect union and establish justice. We want students grappling with this idea, but that we, when they wrote it, that we didn't include everyone. It was a very, very focused and limited discriminatory we. So how did African Americans fight for inclusion into the we? How did they fight for a more perfect union? How does our preamble map onto the reality that people lived? And in particular, what can we learn from resistance to, to slavery? We're still working on language. We've got slavery in there. We've got to go back through and change it to enslavement um, and make sure that we're using people first language and things like that um, that happened in our community. How did communities and social networks support freedom seekers in their struggles? So that's what students start off with. In week one, they engage with community building activities. So one of the important things, and the teachers need a lot of support, is how do you talk about these painful issues of race and struggle and resistance with students in a positive way that doesn't re-traumatize youth of color, put white kids, um, you know, sort of play into white fragility and sort of allow that to take place. And how do you negotiate and navigate these Tricky waters, and teachers don't get a lot of training in that. So one of our things is to try and build in curricular materials that help them begin to think about how to navigate that and give them activities. So community building becomes a really important aspect of that. Students are also asked to think about what do they think, when they see the word freedom, what do they think of? What is their modern 21st century conceptualization of freedom? And we're gonna like compare that and talk about what freedom meant at different historical periods. 
They're also going to get a historical overview of slavery in the United States and Canada with an emphasis on Ontario and Michigan and on the Underground Railroad and other forms of resistance. So they're building up some basic background knowledge, some basic historical knowledge, basic geographic knowledge. They're doing some timeline development again. So that first week is about broad historical overviews. They get exposed to some primary documents and learn a little bit about historical thinking. It's kind of a crash course to get them ready for these deep dives they're going to take into these historical case studies that Chantel's going to talk about. In week two, then, they dive into the case studies, which you'll see in a moment. They're going to, they work with a range of, of documents, videos, multimedia resources, uh, to explore the stories, the case studies of freedom seekers and people involved in resistance. And they're connecting the lessons that they've learned to issues in their community today. One of the major foci of the curriculum, too, is to talk about collective and community resistance. The other thing, the other sort of problematic narrative that students get is they focus on individuals in the, the textbook version of history when they learn about the Underground Railroad. Of course, they learn about Harriet Tubman, an amazing hero that all young people should learn about, but they only learn about Harriet Tubman, maybe Frederick Douglass, and maybe Sojourner Truth. So like the, this whole expansive network of communities and people is reduced to like three or four individuals. Um, so our goal is to help them understand that this was collective resistance, this was community resistance. There were amazing individual heroes, but they couldn't have done it without a whole network of support. And it really, again, helped them understand their place in that kind of, that kind of uh, context. In the third week, they complete their case studies, and they have to choose between four project options, a museum exhibit, a public mural, a children's book, or a historical landmark that honors and celebrates their case study. And they're going to develop a visual or multimedia display as well as a pitch presentation, and then discuss about what lessons can we learn today from, from this particular case study. We hope to get to the point where kids are actually producing that. In our pilot program this summer, simply because of time and because of the virtual context, kids weren't able to fully realize these projects, but they were able to get into the design phase and the initial prototyping of some ideas. And Clarissa will tell you a little bit about that in her video. And then that fourth week is really just a, a public presentation. So this is our ideal vision, is that people from the community would come in and kids would share and maybe one of their ideas would turn into a children's book. Maybe they'll partner with an author. Maybe a muralist will get excited about their idea and a teacher will take that. So the idea is that these actually turn into living projects, living storytelling projects in the community. As designers, we don't have the power to enact that, but we're building the scaffolds and the supports and hoping that teachers and community organizations, that this, again, that this will eventually result in actual works that become public art and public storytelling for kids. A little bit more detail in week one. They're using something called Poll Everywhere. They're creating a word cloud around what freedom means to them. It's kind of a cool exercise. Um, basically, you, each kid goes into this website. They enter in the five words that freedom makes them think of. And then individual words that get more mentions get bigger in the word cloud. And it becomes a real visual representation of a class's or a group's understanding of a particular concept. And then they talk about the patterns and themes they see and begin talking as a group, what does freedom mean to us? From there they do, this is just kind of snapshots of the activities. Um, they get this research question, uh, African American people who escaped slavery were clearly brave and heroic, but was escaping only an individual act or was it a collective action that required relationships and networks and community resistance? That's their research question. And then they get a limited curated set of primary documents. Um, to develop an answer, an evidence-based answer. So we're just introducing them to the idea of you create your own historical narrative based on the evidence that you're interacting with. You've got to read the sources carefully, question who it was written by, and do some historical thinking. So there's a series of activities to support them in that process. One example is a short narrative and, uh, of Lear Green and this picture. And what we want students to begin, well, how did he get in, how did he ship it? Could he have done that by himself or did he need help? Like literally at that level, middle school students questioning this photograph and saying, what does this, if he was successful and able to be packaged into a box and shipped somewhere else, and there's more, there's Henry Box Brown and there's multiple narratives like that. How is that possible? Could one person do that by themselves? No, they had to have a whole network of support. 
So we want them to be able to do that critical thinking just from one picture. And so it's a lot of scaffolding and teacher moves where they're asking questions and getting kids to do the thinking and really generating conclusions. Um, and again, I mentioned those. So as they then, they go through the case studies, which are coming up, and then they have to choose between these four exhibits. And there's scaffolds and like project plans built into the curriculum to help them do each of these. Um, some models to help them envision, well, what might this actually look like? So we share with them. Historical landmarks. So like with historical, so it, with each one, what they're doing is basically for this project, there's, they're not writing a whole book, but they're gonna do a jacket, a description, and the first few pages. Again, and if, if the teacher had more time in their curriculum, they could expand upon it and have kids produce the whole book. For the historical landmark, they're doing a design, an inscription, and sort of a rationale, and a little bit of research about where it might actually go and putting it on an actual map of the city. Where would, where would they want this monument and why there? For a mural, um, they're again kind of doing a design. They have to do an artist statement and a little narrative about the, the story that their mural is telling and a storyboard about who would see it and where. Where would it be and what would the viewing experience be? What would they want people to take away from it? Similar with a museum exhibit, it's a digital museum exhibit, so they have to have images, um, pictures of artifacts, captions, and then again, sort of a description of their ideal interactive experience. What do they want people to take away from this museum exhibit? And that is sort of the very broad overview of the whole curriculum. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Chantel. Chantel, I'm going to advance the slides. I'm going to step to the side. So whenever you're ready to advance the slide, just give me a nod. And I'll go. And Chantel's going to talk. Chantel, let me just give you some props. Is an amazing educator, but also she's a real historical researcher. And she has done an amazing amount of archival research to build these case studies. So I want to just recognize that and honor you. Thank you, Darren. Are you able to hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, my name is Chantal Browning Morgan. I'm a secondary school teacher in Windsor, Ontario. I'm also a curriculum developer. Um, I'm in my 21st year of teaching. I have taught French for most of my career, African studies, native studies, and am currently teaching English as a second language and I also develop curriculum. I am currently working on four other curriculum projects um, at the present moment, but um, it was an honor and still is an honor to be involved with this project. And um, I'd also like to thank Angela for the invite to speak here this morning. Next slide, please. I would like to thank hi um, historical experts who developed videos for the students, but also were sources of knowledge for me throughout this project. Irene Moore Davis, um, Dr. Carolyn Smards Frost, Dr. Roy Finkenbein, Kimberly Simmons, and Dr. Lorene Bridgen. Um, their work was um, so integral to making this um, a success, so I just want to make sure that I am giving them a shout out. Thank you, next slide, please. So for phase one of the project, which Darren just mentioned, um, I developed five case studies and uh, the topics were arrived at after some discussions with historians. So um, students will be looking at Madison and Tabitha Lightfoot, the Colored Vigilant Committee of Detroit, the Refugee Home Society, the Nelson Hackett case, and Thornton and Lucy Blackburn. And Darren already mentioned uh, a lot of the purpose, but we really wanted to highlight the organizing and sense of community and the collaborative resistance to slavery that took place on both sides of the Detroit River. We want students to explore the case studies with a transnational lens. We want them to connect the past with present day struggles. And essentially, we want them to become historians and engage with mostly primary source documents um, in order to respond to a central historical question so that they can learn to evaluate the trustworthiness of multiple perspectives and learn to make historical claims backed by documentary evidence. Next slide. 
Some of the primary source documents that students use um, throughout uh, phase one and throughout the next phase will include um, historical photographs, testimonies, letters, petitions, books, advertisements, wills, sketches, and there are some secondary sources which include newspaper articles. So for the first case study, which is Madison and Tabitha Lightfoot, the central historical question is what made the Lightfoot's exemplary leaders? And the overview that students will receive is that by the early 1830s, Madison Lightfoot was living in Detroit. He married Tabitha in 1831, and together they devoted a significant amount of time and effort to improving the lives of African Americans and African Canadians on both sides of the Detroit River. Both of them would cross the Detroit River many times throughout their lives for faith and abolition concerns. And here we have images of Second Baptist Church because we want students to understand that um, in 1836, Madison and Tabitha Lightfoot were co-founders of Second Baptist and Madison Lightfoot was the church's first clerk. Students will also learn that the church was not only a place of worship, it was also a community, political, and social center where ministers and abolitionists regularly traveled to Canada for services and speaking engagements. It, the church was a significant underground railroad station. So we really want students to look at um, all the different ways that the Lightfoots were involved in um, the case for abolition. Next slide, please. Here we have Sandwich First Baptist Church in Windsor, which is a significant um, national historic site. And this is included in the case study because um, in, in 1851, when it was erected on Peter Street here in Sandwich, which is present day Windsor, Madison J. Lightfoot was the first appointed minister. And this church, like Second Baptist, um, saw rapidly increasing numbers of freedom seekers who were crossing the Detroit River into Canada. The church would receive them, shelter, and assist many of these new arrivals. It was also a center of faith, community, and anti-slavery activities, and the Lightfoots were heavily involved. Next slide, please. Here we have a few more of the sources that students will access, and I'd also like to note that um, the sources in this presentation today are just a small amount of what students will be engaging with. Um, one of the articles here is about the Blackburn Riots of 1833, um, and students will examine documents related to Madison and Tabitha's involvement in the Blackburn Rescue. Both Madison and Tabitha were present at the secret meeting held at the Detroit home of Benjamin Willoughby, where the brilliant and well-orchestrated rescue plan of Lucy Blackburn was hatched. Both Madison and Tabitha Lightfoot were ringleaders of the ingenious and successful plot. <coughs> Students will also read a report that you see on the bottom left and learn about the role that Madison Lightfoot played in the reorganization and organization and activities of the Colored Vigilant Committee of Detroit. They will also read Madison Lightfoot's own words, which appeared from the minutes of the Amherstburg Regular Missionary Baptist Association. This association united churches on both sides of the Detroit River. One of their primary purposes was to provide aid to refugees from slavery. And of course, Madison J. Lightfoot was heavily involved. Um, students will also engage with a census record that you can see on the bottom right, which lists Madison and Tabitha. Next slide, please. Here is an example of an activity that follows one of the documents. So for each primary source document that students engage with, there will be an activity, like you see on the screen, um, which um, includes um, historical thinking activities. So looking at sourcing, um, how can they trust it, how they know it's reliable, looking at the contextualization, uh, the corroboration, and then some close reading questions. So students will, are required to do this after they read each primary source document. Next slide, please. They will also engage in newspaper articles. Um, both of these appeared in the Provincial Freeman. 
and um, students will learn about Madison J. Lightfoot's involvement with the Underground Railroad business um, via the Vigilance Committee, but also that in addition to faith and abolition activities, Madison Lightfoot chaired a meeting at the Second Baptist Church in 1839, where it was resolved that the colored citizens of Detroit would celebrate Emancipation Day on the 1st of August in order of formerly uh, enslaved individuals who are now free in the British West Indies. In 1870, he was the president of the Emancipation Celebration in Detroit. And in 1875, later in his life, he delivered a speech at an Emancipation Celebration on the Canadian side of the Detroit River. So we really want students to understand um, what type of leaders the Lightfoots were, but we don't want to give them the answers. We want them to um, go through the material and make a claim or a position and have evidence to back that up. Next slide, please. And after they have engaged with all of the documents and completed all of the activities, they will um, answer these um, synthesizing questions. Um, what kind of leader was Madison Lightfoot? What information from the document supports your answer? And they have to um, list uh, at least three sources. What information from the document demonstrates how Madison and Tabitha Lightfoot united communities on both sides of the Detroit River? And lastly, what information from the documents demonstrates the collaborative anti-slavery resistance in which Madison and Tabitha Lightfoot participated on both sides of the Detroit River? So this is um, an overview of what students will uh, be required to do in the case of the Lightfoots. Next slide, please. The second case study is on the Colored Vigilant Committee of Detroit. And students will learn that the um, committee assisted thousands of freedom seekers who arrived in the city between 1842 and 1862. This all black committee of 60 to 70 men boasted extensive organization and unchallenged militancy. Also, they had geography on their side because the Detroit River was a convenient international gateway for fugitives to cross into Canada. So stu students will learn um, a lot about William Lambert and George de Baptiste. Next slide, please. They will analyze images of the Detroit River, um, or image, I should say, um, in 1850, just to get a sense of what things looked like at that time, because we really want them to be able to stand in, in the shoes of a historian at that time. Next slide, please. To connect to their present day reality, um, they will learn about the two historical markers. Next slide, please. They will learn um, a little bit more about uh, Second Baptist Church and they will also read a letter from George de Baptiste to Frederick Douglass in which um, de Baptiste talks about um, the business of the Underground Railroad and just how well it was doing. And then students will be required to answer their historical thinking questions. Next slide, please. Students um, will learn about Seymour Finney's barn where the um, Vigilant Committee hid freedom seekers, often feeding them before ferrying them across uh, the Detroit River to Canada the next day. And they will also read um, this article in addition to other articles um, uh, just about how swiftly the Vigilant Committee would mobilize its members to find and harass slave catchers or protect freedom seekers. Next slide, please. Students will engage in um, reading articles about their role in the Underground Railroad and also their rescue of an enslaved girl who was aboard a schooner that was docked at Detroit. Next slide, please. Um, okay, sorry, I just wanted to add that. Um, so before we go to Refugee Home Society, students will complete all of their historical thinking activities and then the synthesizing activity 
in which they will provide evidence of the collaborative anti-slavery resistance efforts that took place on both sides of the Detroit River, the Colored Vigilant Committee's excellent planning, organization, and leadership skills, as well as providing evidence of their militancy. After examining all sources, they will assume a position on what the purpose of the Colored Vigilant Committee was, and they will be required to provide evidence. Now, the third case study that students will engage with is the Refugee Home Society. And the central question here is, was it a success or was it a failure? So students, um, just some background information, the Refugee Home Society was formed in 1851 by a group of abolitionists on both sides of the Detroit River. They met in Farmington and decided to purchase land for freedom seekers who escaped from slavery in the United States and made the courageous journey to Canada. Students will learn about Henry Bibb and um, what his mission was behind the Refugee Home Society. Students will, um, you can see the Constitution and bylaws there. Students will engage in the con uh, reading the Constitution and bylaws, particularly the ones that caused the most controversy. They will examine multiple articles from The Voice of the Fugitive. Next slide, please. Um, but they will also examine multiple perspectives, including those who oppose some of the activities of the Refugee Home Society. So on the left, we have notes of Canada West in which Marianne Shad um, expresses her opposition. Um, students will engage in the letter from Samuel Ringgold Ward that you see in the middle there, in which he also expresses his um, dissatisfaction with the Refugee Home Society. And then they will also hear from an agent. Um, so multiple perspectives students will engage um, in during this case study. Next slide, please. And then students will engage in about five or six testimonials from various sources. Um, some were residents of the Refugee Home Society. Some were just freedom seekers who lived in the area. And um, from those various sources, um, after they analyze them and look at the trustworthiness, the bias, the reliability, they will be able to arrive at a position about whether they believe the Refugee Home Society was successful or was it a failure? And they will also be required to provide evidence to support their position. Next slide, please. So here is um, an example of an activity that they will do. So they've got um, six testimonials that they will read. They will look at, did they support it? They need the evidence. Why might they trust this source, but why might they not trust this source? So they might say, well, might not trust Laura Haviland because you know she was an agent of the Refugee Home Society. So we really want students, uh, we don't want to give them the answers or tell them how to think. We just want to provide them with the material and uh, let them review the evidence and um, then use that evidence to support their position. Next slide, please. And then um, they will complete the final activity where they have to have at least three sources to um, support their position. They have to, have to have the evidence and provide an explanation about how the evidence supports their position on whether they believe the Refugee Home Society was a success or a failure. Next slide, please. The fourth case study, um, which is one of the ones that was studied um, during the summer in the Wolverine Pathways program, is the Nelson Hackett case. And what I wanted students to do with this case is to um, look at all of the evidence and determine should he have been extradited to Arkansas because there were two different schools of thought at that time. And um, just some background information, the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 received royal assent on August 28, 1833 and it took effect on August 1st, 1834, which essentially abolished slavery throughout most of the British Empire, which included Canada. This act freed over 800,000 enslaved African people. As a result, an increasing number of courageous freedom seekers fled oppression and slavery in the United States and made the journey to Canada since um, we were a British subject at that time. 
Nelson Hackett was one of them, uh, but tragically he would become the first and only freedom seeker to be returned to slavery. Uh, next slide, please. So in this case study, um, I've included in this presentation just some of the documents that students will engage in. There are a lot more. Um, one of the documents that they will review is the 1840 Bill of Sale for Nelson Hackett that you see here. Next slide, please. An image of the riverfront. Um, the reason I included images is that I want students to um, analyze the historical significance of, of these images. They will engage um, with maps. So here you see Arkansas, where he was enslaved at the time. And next slide, please. And then a map of Canada West. And there are other maps um, included in this case study as well. Uh, students will also review the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833. Um, very briefly, just to gain an understanding as to um, one of the um, reasons that made Canada a safe haven and a refuge for freedom seekers fleeing oppression and slavery. Next slide, please. Um, the, uh, students will see a photograph of a Chatham home around the time that Nelson Hackett would have arrived in Chatham um, here in Ontario or Upper Canada. Um, for his very brief time that he did spend here. Next slide, please. Analyzing artwork for historical significance. This is um, the Detroit River. Next slide, please. Also analyzing the historical significance of this image of the Detroit jail where uh, Nelson Hackett spent some time before he was um, extradited back to Arkansas. Next slide. Students will also uh, read a report that appeared in the Anti-Slavery Reporter on the case of Nelson Hackett, as well as reading a letter from Hiram Wilson um, to, just to understand a little bit more about the case and what happened to Nelson once he was returned. Next slide, please. Um, so students will answer the, the question, should he have been extradited to Arkansas? They have to have their sources, they have to have their evidence. But one of the other activities that um, they do in this case study is um, I, really, I really want them to demonstrate an understanding of Nelson Hackett's agency, the collaborative resistance that took place on both sides of the border in response to his arrest. So you had um, people in Detroit who were outraged. You had people as far as Hamilton, Ontario, um, who, who wrote a letter. Um, so I really want students to understand just how many people were involved in this resistance on both sides of the border. Um, but I also want them to demonstrate understanding of the efforts that were made to ensure that Canada remained a safe haven for freedom seekers. In addition to um, six or seven activities that they will be required to do upon completing the, um, going through the primary source documents. And then, as you see here on the screen, they will answer their historical question. Next slide, please. And the last case study, which is also one um, that was piloted in the summer um, under Clarissa Codrington through the Michigan Pathway Program, is the, the Blackburn case. And for this one, the students are going to answer who or what caused the Blackburn riots of 1833. So here we see um, the plaque that's here um, in Canada and one that is in Kentucky. And the background knowledge that the children, uh, that the students will receive is that um, on July uh, 3rd, 1831, Thornton and Lucy Blackburn made a bold and courageous escape from slavery in Kentucky. They were dressed finely, they had their forged documents, um, and they, these documents stated that they were free persons of color. They made their way to the city of Detroit where they enjoyed living um, in freedom. However, two years later, they were arrested and tried as fugitives, uh, being sentenced to return to a lifetime of slavery in Kentucky uh, because the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 ensured that fugitive slaves apprehended north of the Ohio River would be returned to their owners. The black community on both sides of the border was outraged. Um, the black community of Detroit threatened to burn the city to the ground. While the well-respected couple were jailed, men and women from Detroit met and came up with an ingenious rescue plan 
The result would go down in Detroit history as the Blackburn Riots of 1833 and the first racial riots in Detroit. Next slide, please. And um, here are just a few of um, the primary source documents that students will access. Um, this one is an inventory of Gideon Brown's assets, which lists um, Negro Man Thornton, um, and his value is $400. Next slide, please. Students will review the slave notice that appeared after Thornton fled from Kentucky, and then they have um, you know, uh, some questions, some historical thinking questions to answer based on this. Like, why do you think he may have left July 3rd or 4th? Like, what was happening in the United States at that time? Um, and just sort of um, um, looking at why were certain words bolded or why was he described a certain way and um, different uh, questions along that nature. And um, next slide, please. Students will um, analyze the historical significance of this view of Sandwich from 1833, which includes an image of the jail where the Blackburns spent time after they made it across the Detroit River to Sandwich, present day Windsor. Next slide, please. They will read the testimony of the sheriff's deputy, and they will also read Thornton's petition in addition to many other sources. Next slide, please. Students will complete a synthesizing activity which asks them to find evidence in the documents that demonstrates the effective leader, that effective leadership was an important factor to the success of the Blackburn rescue, that careful planning and organization contributed to the successful rescue, and that collaborative resistance was taking place on both sides of the Detroit River. And then they will answer their historical question and um, come up with their position, what or who caused the riots, and then use evidence to support it. Next slide, please. And we are currently working on phase two, so making more detailed um, teacher-friendly lesson plans. And um, as Darren mentioned, um, this will involve schools in Windsor, so grade seven, and in Michigan, grade eight. Um, we looked at the curriculum at where, in which grade students learn about the Underground Railroad, and that is how we came up with um, grade seven and eight. And um, the other case studies that are in the process of being developed for phase two include the Denison family, the John Anderson case, the Provincial Freeman, and the Voice of the Fugitive. So students, again, will have a central historical question. They will engage with the documents um, answer their historical thinking questions, do a synthesizing activity, and then be prepared to arrive at a position and have evidence to back their position. Thank you so much for inviting me and for listening to my portion of the presentation. I am now going to turn it back over to Darren who will play Clarissa Codrington's video. Thank you. But the states, you know, the, the eighth grade U.S. history, they have to teach, like, basically from a little bit of background, Revolutionary War, all the way up to and including Reconstruction. So they have to cover a lot of content. So the case studies are uh, organized right now in what we call jigsaw learning. So students work in teams. They're not all doing every assignment because that would just, that would take a whole school year. So basically one team of kids divides up the documents for one, they get assigned an individual case study. They become the experts in that case study. Each kid within a team becomes an expert in a set of, in like two to three documents. So every kid's not reading everything because we just don't have the time for that um, in a teacher's curriculum. So to make it manageable, again, it's a jigsaw format. So kids in one group will become an expert in their document. Then they synthesize across the documents as a team and create their final product. And then the final product serve to educate the community, but also to educate other kids about each of the case studies. So I just wanted to clarify that because I didn't make that super clear before. Because it's a ton of content, 
and a ton of documents, and there's just not time in a teacher's uh, school year to engage kids in that deep of an inquiry. Again, we, we wish we could. We feel like they would actually gain more out of it than this rapid survey of history that they get. But we're doing what we can to create usable materials that teachers will actually take up. And they're gonna have to give something up to go this deep into the history, but we think it's well worth it. And we think we can find enough teachers to work with us that, that will do that on later on. So right now we're gonna hear from Clarissa Codrington, who was the instructor who piloted it this summer, and she's just gonna share some of her reflections. Again, she couldn't be here today because she's working with many of those same kids today. So we're glad that she's still with working with them. Hello. My name is Clarissa Codrington, and I am here to give you the instructor's perspective of this um, experience. So a little bit about me. I grew up in Michigan, um, and uh, my mom is from Detroit, and my dad's from Barbados. They met in college. And um, I went away for, for undergrad, but I studied history. Um, as an undergrad and then I graduated realized I didn't really know what to do with that so then eventually I um, got my master's in teaching English as a second language and um, have been teaching in that space ever since now um, I'm not the first in my family to graduate my mother and father were uh, from university but uh, I think even still I have the ability to, um, or this gave me the ability to have empathy for those who don't have that kind of, um, of educational background and how hard that can be. So um, basically all of these things combined to make me um, a, a good instructor for this set of students because I have a lot of empathy for them and I have a passion for history and some connection to it as well. Okay, so uh, in terms of my experience in the classroom space, we used Google Classroom, and this was my first time using it. Um, I'm not incredibly tech savvy, but I found it um, pretty easy to adapt to, and it didn't hurt at all to have such support and such well-constructed and well-organized, well-structured um, curriculum, so thanks to the curriculum team. Um, so we ended up using uh, both the Google Classroom and uh, Zoom to conduct uh, the classes. And, um, you know, this was the summer of 2021. Uh, so these students had just gone through, you know, the worst school year of all time, probably. And so they started out with their cameras on. I used mine the entire time. I encouraged them the whole time to use it and to like try to connect with each other, you know, by looking at one another, but sure enough, uh, you know, by the middle of week two, all the cameras were off. Uh, um, uh, but I just soldiered on and encouraged them to use their voices, um, to use the chat box, to use private messages in order to engage. And I just continued to demonstrate how I would want them to, to engage uh, in the virtual space by keeping my camera on, continuing to smile, all that kind of thing. Um, Overall, the classroom experience was easy, despite a few, you know, technological quirks. The good thing is I've learned a lot to just, if you have any technological issues, you move on as quickly as possible um, if you can't get it figured out. Okay, um, so the, I'll go on to the students' proposed projects. So uh, you have seen already quite a few of um, the case studies and we ended up with two groups. And so one group had the Blackburns and one group had um, the Nelson Hackett case. And the group that had the Blackburns decided to do a museum exhibit. Um, so for their project, they ended up doing kind of a PowerPoint slide of what that museum exhibit would look like, you know, as if each uh, PowerPoint slide was one museum plaque um, and that was like to represent what they would present if they had the chance to put it in a museum um, they felt that the story would be best presented in that way um, in that format meanwhile for the Nelson Hackett case um, the group decided on a monument and 
I think they really liked the idea of a black man on a horse as a you know as a statue because think about what we normally see you know Napoleon uh, on a horse or other white men so to kind of turn that um, trope on its head would be powerful in itself um, then uh, I want to talk about the feedback from the students. So this was, of course, uh, the most rewarding part of the experience. Again, as I said, I didn't see their faces after a while, so I was a little nervous. Um, and you know, most of my experience is working with uh, community college and university level students uh, in the um, English as a second language space. So I was a little worried that I'd be able to connect with them, but oh man. It ended up really great. So here's some of um, their direct feedback. Um, one student said, they didn't think it would be interesting, but many things caught their eye. To me, this is the, the perfect kind of feedback because um, it shows a willingness to, um, despite not necessarily being interested, still say something positive. I think that's, that's great. Um, a couple other students said it was pretty fun. It was well-structured. Again, thank you, curriculum team. Um, something that was difficult for them once they had to do the project they had to collaborate with one another that was very difficult for them to do with schedules and jobs and online and not being able to drive and things like that but despite that um, one student's feedback said that the scheduling was difficult but they would do it again again awesome um, another student said they were not necessarily a history person but understands why people would like it that is wonderful. That shows um, an open-mindedness to things. And, and I mean, you can work with that. Um, if you can just have that little seed of, hey, I can understand why somebody else might like this, then you can run with that. Um, um, one student echoed all of our sentiment by saying that they wanted to do this in person and they wanted to see their friends. You know, some of them have been in the program together for a while. They have friends and they're really looking for human connection. So um, I think all of us felt the same way. And finally, a few of them said they would do it again if offered. So I think it really served to activate their um, you know, historical thinking brain and help them understand that they are part of history, they are making it right now, and they can also go out and seek this history on their own, and that was, um, you know, that was one of the goals. So I think they did it overall. The students were honest and engaged despite any of the kind of challenges or despite what I th what I thought was, um, you know, not engagement because of the camera. So that was really wonderful. Finally, I want to talk about some best practices for anybody who might um, end up doing this same curriculum um, in a virtual space. Um, and a lot of this I've already shared with the curriculum team, so they know that. But, um, you know, some sort of answer key for the instructors or like an overview of the case studies so that um, can find ways to steer students um, in case it ends up being maybe a little bit too much for them at the beginning. There's a lot of synthesis, a lot of analysis. Um, and th those are skills, those are difficult skills. And so um, being able to find, like exactly pinpoint where the places where students might need a little bit more support in that um, might be necessary for future instructors. Um, not only that, but kind of monitoring students and finding instances where the lessons can be connected to them. Um, of course, the location helps the to connect them, but there was one thing that surprised me. At one point, the students had to try to find, um, they had to try to find an instance of freedom seeking and collaboration today and see and connect that to what they were learning um, in, in these case studies. And I don't know, maybe it's because I'm always watching the news. I could think of a million things, but actually the students had a little bit harder time finding concrete examples of that. So um, knowing uh, that now, what I would have done is kind of take a side track and maybe have them do like a quick news article search or something like that to try to find something to connect. So being on the lookout for those kinds of instances would be um, um, really powerful and helpful for future instructors. Um, I think we ended up 
uh, getting to do this kind of halfway through, but I think introducing the curriculum creators at the very beginning, either um, having them visit the classroom space, having them make a video um, to really drive home that this is not in a book. These um, you know Underground Railroad descendants are among us. They're 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 here for us to learn from right now. Um, I think that would really help students understand just how important and um, uh, interesting this story is and relevant to their lives um, if that were a part of the process. Um, I think uh, a template of some sort for the project. So as I mentioned before, uh, the students who did the Blackburn case, they ended up kind of doing like a PowerPoint slides to mimic museum um, placards. And um, in my mind, I imagined, for example, like if you were gonna make a comic book and you can find templates of that like online to just like put your um, put your content into. If there were something like that for students to be able to do, then um, there'd be less time trying to figure out how to make this thing look like something and instead building the actual um, project. Um, and then finally, oh, oh, no, not finally. Um, Eve, I know COVID got in our way, but if there were a chance to do like even a virtual museum trip, of course, you know, most of the students had probably been to museums before, but um, I think it was a little bit hard for them to like truly understand what it was they were trying to um, create. I think if they had had that museum um, image in their mind, they'd be like, oh, yes, that's right. Okay, it would go over here in the museum or something like that. Um, so that would be really helpful for them. And then finally, um, reassuring students. I think that, you know, like most black people in the United States, you go through this sense of betrayal at some point, like, wait a minute, um, we're learning about this. What does this mean for me? What does this mean for my identity? And um, I think, unfortunately, we all have to go through it and we all want to like avoid our children having to deal with that. So really being ready to reassure them during that time of where they're kind of going through that sense of betrayal and just help them um, know that like, it is not some shameful thing. Some students said, oh, I, I can't believe that I didn't know this, I grew up in Detroit. And we, we let them know, um, that's not on you. That is your education system failing you. That's us failing you. And we're here to rectify that. Um, so really being that support system for them during that time. And, and like I mentioned, just let them know that they have an active role in history making and um, it doesn't happen to us. We are making it and they get to be a part of that too and share it with their friends and family. Um, overall, it was an incredible experience. I'm looking forward to doing it again next uh, summer with these lessons in mind and um, getting to help build our next little cohort of uh, historians. All right, thanks for your time. Thanks to Clarissa who couldn't be here. Um, and that's, that's the, let's see, is Chantal still with us? Yes, <laughs> wonderful. Um, so now we'll take any questions. If anybody has any questions, we'll just kind of open up the floor to a uh, discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, can you bring this, I'm gonna, can you bring up the slide presentation again? And just go to the last slide, our email, at, probably the easiest way is just to feel free to reach out to myself and or Chantel directly. Um, yep, yep. And we'd, we'd be happy to um, share. And again, the, the rollout procedure will be, um, where we're still in the process of rewriting and adapting. Um, the real challenge is getting this to fit into the curriculum, right? To try and make it big enough that it's meaningful, but small enough that teachers will actually use it. Um, so there's a lot of balancing in there and making it adaptive and flexible. And then we're gonna be um, connecting with uh, local districts uh, and teach individual teachers, um, probably more in the winter, 
but happy to share things that, for anybody in the audience today. We absolutely, we'll, we'll get you involved. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Uh-huh. So, uh, Chantel, um, well, Chantel and I compared, um, we literally pulled up the content expectations and standards and found that seventh grade in Canada most closely aligns to eighth grade in Michigan. Um, I kind of like Canada's better. They go a little <laughs> deeper. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Michigan has revamped standards. They're not great, but they're better than they were. Um, I don't know, Chantel, do you want to, you have any, did you hear the question? It's about like, how do we negotiate the differences between Canada and the U.S. in terms of curriculum? Um, I, I don't know, that's a good question. We're still I mean, working on it. Yeah, seven and eight, they're pretty similar um, around the same time period. So yeah, that's something that we're, we're still gonna work through. It even goes to language. We just had a conversation last week about spelling. Like a word like color is spelled differently in the United States and Canada. There's a lot, labor, color, there's many words that are spelled differently. So like, and right now, to be quite frank, it's written from a United States centric position just because that's my mindset. So when I'm framing out lessons and teacher instructions, so Chantel and I are trying to figure out how to work through that and, and reading with this more transnational lens is, is it's an interesting exercise for sure that I've never done before. So we're trying to get a clean recording. So I'm going to have you use the mic. What was the average number of students on each project? Well, for this first pilot, it was a really, uh, they were very small groups. There were eight students that stuck with the summer learning program, so each one was about four. But in our classroom version, what we recommend for teachers is, is about that size as well. Four is sort of a, a good size for collaborative teamwork. You can go to five, you can go to three, but that's kind of the sweet spot is four. I had a question, but I also uh, recognize that my cousin and I are here, are descendants of the Jane and John Freeman. So we were really appreciative to see that on the screen, that our history was there. And um, we've been to the, which was Grandma Butler's house, and that's on that property in Pews. So we're actually to see that we're part of bigger part of the world. <laughs> That's wonderful. And if you're interested, email us. We'd love to, you know, if you have any interest in like doing a short video or something like that and having it included, like how this history lives on, where we would love to, to have your participation. And Chantel didn't mention it, but Chantel, you have your own historical connection. You are, a, I don't want to speak for you. I'm a sixth generation Underground Railroad descendant. Uh, my family has, has been here since the late 1800s in um, New Canaan, Chatham. Um, Dresden area, as well as Windsor. So I have very deep roots to Essex and Kent County here. So it's really cool to have descendants on both sides of the border involved in communicating and aware. It's, it's just what we really strive for is for kids to see this is living history. This is still part of part of their legacy. And is, is that part of what you're trying to do? So I'm often struck that Underground Railroad history is in part family history. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, yeah, I mean, it's just something that you all have spent time trying to call out for students and to get them to think about? I'd say we haven't yet, but I, I, there's no reason why we can't go that way. And, as, and, you know, through presentations and discussions like this, people give us new ideas and new angles. So I think if we can build that in. Um, and students, do, you know, students live in their own lives very much. They're very centered on their own lives. So if we can get into family histories, which get complicated in schools, but um, you know, there's definitely a, there's fertile ground there for exploration, and we're absolutely open to expanding our, our conceptualization of, of history and historical thinking and include family narratives. It was a four-week project. So how many, did they meet every day for four weeks? That's a great question. They met uh, four days a week. So the summer programming was four days a week, full time for, um, so from, for four hours a day. 
So it was a pretty limited experience from uh, 9.30 to 1.30, Monday through Thursday. They were able to do their own work on Fridays if they wanted to. I, I don't think they, they chose to use their time that way, but it's summertime. I, I don't judge. Um, and then that fourth week actually was only a, a day of prep and a presentation, so it wasn't a full fourth week. Um, what we envision is asking teachers to, to try and find the way. You can't really do this in less than three weeks, and that's really challenging for teachers to devote, but we think we can, we can make it work and we can find adjustments in the curriculum and, and collaborate with teachers to, to make it work, but it would take about three weeks to really do it well. Um, I've always felt cheated out of not knowing certain parts of history, and I think my children were cheated out of it. I don't want my grandchildren to be cheated out of it. Is this primarily just going, I'll back up. We had a Liberian refugee living with us, and she echoed the comment about being angry about not knowing this information? Are we including Caucasian or European descendant Americans, Canadians in this conversation, or is it primarily targeting African Americans? I mean, they're already there, so uh, I'm not, so, so yeah, I mean, th there were certainly uh, white abolitionists involved in this, but what, we hope to do is center the role, center the agency of the black community and not to leave anybody, like white people are never gonna get left out of traditional history instruction. Um, I'm not worried about that. What we wanna do is pull in these other voices and experiences. And it's really more about play space too. So it's about, um, it's not that students don't learn about the Underground Railroad, but they don't, students in Detroit don't learn enough about the Underground Railroad in Detroit. It depends on their teacher. If they have a great teacher who's done their own research, they'll learn it. But it shouldn't be dependent on those teachers to become experts. It's systemically, there's a lack of focus and resources. And it's, so there's, there's multiple layers here too. Pedagogically, we want more place-based education because we want students to connect what they're learning in the classroom to their own lives. And that's not just, that, that could fit for, for all students, um, you know, de de devoid of, not, not dependent upon race or ethnicity. We want students to learn about the histories, the real histories of the communities in and around them. So this, like in understanding that, that idea of a river, and it's really, I think, mind-bending for students to think that African Americans were considered refugees in Canada. And now if we think about what lens does that give us to think about refugee, the narrative around refugees today, it's really complicating things. And so we want students of all races to identify with these histories and think about their own family histories and, again, see themselves as participants in history. Okay, last question. It was more of a comment, actually. Um, I appreciate what, what you're doing and what they're learning because they, our kids have not gotten enough of it. Um, but what I truly appreciated and would like to see expanded, too, was I loved the way you were incorporating the fact that they weren't just as educators called monkey work, um, reading and repeating. They were actually looking at documents and saying, is this, is this real? How do, we, how do we research? How do we look and see which documents are the ones that we use? Which ones are, are real? Which ones are fake? Which ones are um, uh, the best to, to use when we're doing the research? And educating at an upper level, our kids at this level are not getting enough of that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we need to start more at this younger age of saying that when you're doing research and so that they can look at these documents and say, okay, who were these people and how do I find out more about them and what's real and what's not? And I, I really appreciated that part of them synthesizing, you know, those documents. Thank you. I'll just add, in a best case scenario, we'll have teacher training because that's hard work. That is not easy to support kids in learning from documents when they've never had that experience before and they haven't been taught how to do so. It's really complicated pedagogy. So we're hoping to eventually get to the point where we can support, where teachers need support to do this work and they don't have it right now. So we need to do a better job at supporting our, our educators. Great, well thank you so much. Yep, thank you. Thank you so much for coming in. <laughs> Couldn't, still can't travel across the border. So uh, we're great to have you uh, being there.
really good to see you, Chantel. Thanks. I'll also just add to that this is a pilot. It's being developed. We would love to see it grow, go into other kinds of schools and educational contexts. Um, it's been a real pleasure for a lot of us here at Michigan to partner um, with these folks in developing this kind of work, to partner with community organizations to help put some of our resources in the service of these kinds of projects that serve a, a broader public good. Um, and this is one that we are really delighted to see grow and develop.